Hey, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine here tonight. Uh, this is season three, episode five, coming to you from Arlington, Virginia. I want to welcome everybody online on this Monday evening. And uh, we'll wait a moment to uh, have folks come on. I'll start looking for your names popping up in the comments window here shortly. And uh, while we're waiting, I'll tell you a little bit about sponsor this evening. This is the Excelsior Brigade, the fine folks at Excelsior Brigade, uh, Jim Quinlan, uh, Candace Quinlan, and Sheila Vaughn. Uh, if you're at the DC Photo Show last weekend, uh, you probably had a chance to meet them and see their fine collection of images. They specialize in identified carts to visit of Union soldiers. Also connected with the Arlington Cemetery Project, which is identifying Civil War soldier and sailor graves from among the 440,000 servicemen and women who are buried there. So a tip of the cap to Jim and Candace and Sheila for all the fine work they do. If you can, go visit the Excelsior Brigade, excelsiorbrigade.com, and check them out. Got a lot of folks coming on this evening. I see Jim Rivest, Kevin Camberg, one of our senior editors, Liz Topping, Michael Passaro, Gene McCallum is here, Bobby McCoy. A lot of folks coming on. So glad that you're here tonight. And uh, while we're waiting for a few more to come on, let me tell you about this image that you probably saw uh, last week. We've been hard at work, and when I say we, I mean, Doug York of Civil War Faces and myself uh, putting together a uh, collection of Civil War or African-American Civil War era images that are going to be part of a display at the Goodridge House in York, Pennsylvania. There's a third member of our crew that I should mention, and that's Allison Renner. She's the liaison with the Goodridge House. Uh, the three of us are working together to bring a selection of images and we've put out a call to action on Facebook to collect images from the images that we collect and our due date is April 1st. We're going to select some number of them for inclusion in the show. Now, we're not going to be using the images themselves, but we're going to be getting high resolution scans making museum quality prints, and then mounting them and putting them up at the house. So you've got plenty of time, about two weeks. If you have a soldier, a sailor, a civilian from the Civil War era, can be an Ambra type, a tin type, a daguerreotype, carts to visit, album prints, uh, contact me uh, at Military Images Magazine, contact Doug York at Civil War Faces, and uh, we'll get them into our pool of candidate images from which we're going to make our final selections. We don't know how many yet, but we're going to figure that out. So what else do I have here while we're waiting? Oh, hold on a second here. Look at this. It's the latest issue of Military Images magazine. Uh, it was uh, mailed uh, late last week, and uh, I know that a lot of you are beginning to receive or have already received your copies and uh, getting some rave review reviews, I'm pleased to say. Uh, an interesting combination. We have Georgians in Gray from the David Vaughn collection combined with Sherman at 200, a collection of images from the Jerry Everts collection. So if you're a subscriber, I hope you have it or will soon receive it. If you're a digital subscriber, you already have it for sure. And if you're not a subscriber, I think that now would be a great time to do it. So go to shopmilitaryimages.com. Actually, don't go now. Wait until the show's over. Go to shopmilitaryimages.com after the show's over. And I'll give you a little bit of a tip. As you're going through, uh, type in the promo code PHOTO COLLECTOR in all caps, and you'll save 25%. So get a subscription for yourself, give a gift to a friend, but uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Remember the promo code, photo collector. Now, let's put this over to the side. Um, we all know we're all in the midst of the coronavirus and um, uh, many of us doing our civic duty to make sure that the curve, uh, the contagious, this curve stays down. The further we can push it down, the more lives we can save. 
save. So as I was thinking over the last few days about the impact of the coronavirus, my um, thoughts went to the Civil War period. Uh, as many of you know who are students of the Civil War, disease was rampant. Uh, throughout the entire war, you, many of you know the stories of the regiments, uh, these young men who come from relatively isolated towns and villages who haven't had that much exposure to, to disease uh, would come in contact with the measles, uh, chicken pox, and uh, other childhood diseases, and of course, uh, dysentery, yellow fever, uh, malaria, and all of that consumption some of them would, would, would eventually get. So a lot of death and destruction from that. And um, as I was thinking about all that, uh, a story, a story came to mind, a special story that I told some years ago. And um, it all started when I acquired this photograph. And as you might imagine, I acquired the photograph not because of the story. I didn't know his story at the moment, um, but uh, I acquired for a rather simplistic reason. And there was this, the fact that he had his mouth open and you could see his teeth. And I thought that was highly unusual. And in fact, it turns out that, as you guys know, you don't see that uh, quite often. So um, he was identified on the back as um, Algernon Marble Squire. And um, I did some research into his life story and uh, discovered that as a young man, he was about 18, 19 years old, he joined the 9th Vermont Infantry. He's listed as a private, has a common soldier, and he winds up being um, uh, at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, when the city is uh, captured by Stonewall Jackson's forces. And that's in the fall, uh, that's in uh, 1862. Um, and uh, Squire remains behind with the men. He's not wounded. Um, he's, it seems like he might actually have a chance to escape, but he stays behind with the sick and injured men. This is the first evidence I could find of him being a caregiver. So around this time, I was contacted by someone with this image, who is also Algernon Marble Squire. Only this time, you see he's wearing the caduceus, he's wearing the armband here, and in fact, he's wearing the uniform of a hospital steward. So uh, here's Algernon, who goes from being a private in the 9th Vermont, he's captured along with the men he's taken care of at Harper's Ferry. He goes to Chicago. Uh, he's a paroled prisoner there and um, remains until he's exchanged. He comes back, um, returns to duty as a hospital steward. So he passes the exam and um, he gets his, uh, his conduces, he gets his armband and becomes a hospital steward. Now, he serves in this capacity for the rest of the war. At the end of the war, he does something that you see happen in World War II uh, with the GIs on the GI Bill going to college. Algernon Squire goes to college. He goes to Georgetown, uh, which is at that time uh, on the edge of Washington, D.C., of course, a big part of Washington, D.C. He goes to Georgetown and he come, becomes a doctor. Now, he remains in the regular army during this time working as a hospital steward. He becomes a doctor, he gets his medical degree, and um, there's no room in the army for surgeons at this point in time because the army has been so pared back uh, due to the cost, due to the expense uh, during the war. So the army has been definitely cut seriously back and um, Algernon wants to be a military doctor. He becomes a contract surgeon. He finishes his schooling in 1867, just a couple years after the war. And um, he gets uh, an opportunity to become a contract surgeon. He gets hired and his first assignment is out west. So he's sent um, uh, out to the west and he sent out there for a specific purpose, and that's to take care of a battalion. That battalion of men belonged to the 18th Kansas Cavalry. Now, the 18th Kansas was en route. This is July of 1867. The 18th Kansas Battalion, sorry, the 18th Kansas uh, Cavalry Battalion 
was en route from Fort Harker to Fort Larned in Kansas. And those of you who know your history well know Fort Harker and Fort Larned. And um, he's en route. Uh, the men are falling ill with cholera and Squire joins them and uh, serves his first duty as a surgeon, as a contract surgeon. When it's all over in the battalion, so many men fall ill and Squire is credited with saving the lives of 36 of those men. His first assignment, 36 men. Uh, the reports credit him personally with saving 36 men. Now, there were some deaths, for sure, uh, from cholera out in the west between those two forts in the hot July summer of 1867. One of the men who didn't make it was Squire. He contracted cholera and never left Kansas. So when I'm thinking about coronavirus and thinking about the doctors and nurses who are out there today doing their best to save lives, I think of Dr. Algernon Marble Squire and his assignment at Fort Harker and Fort Larned. So a tip of the cap to him. Now, I want to go back to the DC photo show that I mentioned earlier for our next segment. We'll call this one Randy's Shoebox of Miracles. It was towards the end of the show, and just to give you the lay of the land, um, I was sitting at a table, and uh, the military images table, next to me was was Luther, a Civil War photo sleuth. Um, he was doing his business uh, demonstrating how Civil War photo sleuth works. And uh, next to Kurt was New York. And as I mentioned, it's getting towards the end of the show. It's been a great day. We're all um, busy, a lot of activity, a lot of folks coming around. And um, uh, a woman comes up to the table, introduces herself as a new subscriber name is Randy, and uh, it turns out that she's a former fashion designer, and um, she collects images because she loves the uniforms. And it makes sense because she's a, fas she's a fashionista, and uh, she loves the uniforms, loves studying the uniforms. And um, she had the shoebox, and she opened the shoebox, and, um, you know, I, I've seen lots of shoeboxes full of images, and like anything, you really don't know what you're going to get inside. Could be some nice things in a shoebox. Maybe not so many nice things. Randy's shoebox was quite impressive. <laughs> One of the first images that I saw is uh, uh, an image. I'm not quite sure to do it justice here. Um, it's crystal clear. Absolutely gorgeous. A uh, young soldier holding a a very small revolver. Uh, the background behind it is that the bucolic lake seems absolutely stunning. Sort of got my, uh, built my appetite a little bit for more. Another image she had, one of the films I saw was this one. Also just incredibly pristine. Uh, the canteen with the cloth covering uh, is just, it, it's so real. I wanted to pop the cork and take a drink. It seems so absolutely real. Just, just, uh, just so 3D, so powerful. This young man dressed in his uh, obviously just issued uniform and equipment. And then there's more. Is this image uh, of a, like a militia, a militia man with his uh, shako and nicely red trimmed uh, um, top, his palm on top of that, the red trimmed cuff, the red trimmed collar, holding his weapon, his bay, and he's got his dress gloves on. Just a just stunning, stunning image. And all this is in Randy's shoebox, uh, and she collects them because she really likes the, the uniforms. Just great. Um, I, I loved her enthusiasm. And then you got a bunch of cadets. Again, stunningly perfect. All these cadets with their white cross belts on, uh, three rows of buttons. Um, you all who know uh, schools, uh, can probably uh, investigate this a little further. 
And uh, I may be in touch with some of you watching tonight to help me out on this one. But wow, absolutely stunning image. During the course of the conversation, she says to me, well, she says, I really like the Southern images. And then we start to get into this. Uh, we've got this one here. And I got to tell you, I haven't done any research yet. So um, still fresh off the DC show, haven't dug into this. This one on the back says Tillman Ferguson, Virginia, 1862. Could be a Richmond Depot uh, jacket. At least it's got those uh, shoulder straps up top there. Definitely worthy of research. I haven't even checked HDS to see if he's in there. Um, gosh, a great photograph. A young man staring straight at the camera. Uh, looks like he's he's he definitely has a determined look on his face for sure. Uh, Randy pulls out an image of uh, this soldier wearing a uh, sharply tinted red uh, hunting shirt. Uh, we know them today as battle shirts. Um, he's got his musket in his hand. It appears to be a gray cap. Uh, getting back to the battle shirt, the hunting shirt, it's nicely trimmed. Uh, it's got some blouse-like sleeves on it. Just, just an absolutely wonderful photograph. Light tinting on the cheeks. And then uh, you've got this image here. Another uh, super clear one. It says uh, Uncle Skyler Fitzpatrick uh, on it. Um, I, I did. I had to do a little bit of research on one of these. Only one scholar, Fitzpatrick, uh, and uh, he served in a Texas cavalry regiment. And um, guess what? There's a, there's a, a note in the back that says uh, Uncle Schuyler Fitzpatrick uh, was killed um, in 1863 in Texas. And then it goes on. My uncle's or my mother's brother. Uh, goes on from there. Anyway, more work to be done on uh, Schuyler Fitzpatrick, who I believe, at least according to the record, was in the South Texas Cavalry. Oh, and then there's this one. It's the last one I'm going to show you from Randy's shoebox. And uh, this gentleman has identified, oh, guess what? There's another period inscription in the back. Uh, Captain James A. Lang, uh, first volunteer in the first regiment, killed and buried on the battlefield of Franklin, Tennessee. It goes on from there. So I got that start to do, but I can tell you, Randy's shoebox is definitely full of miracles, uh, as was the rest of the show. Um, and uh, I, I just love it when I go to a show and I get to meet folks like Randy who uh, are passionate, passionate collectors. We come from the, the, the spectrum, across the spectrum. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fashionista, I'm not, I've never studied fashion, um, but Randy has, and, and that was her entry point into the Civil War. I love the fact that the Civil War can draw people from so many different walks of life to become interested. So a uh, tip of the cap, to Randy tonight. I don't know if you're watching Randy, but uh, gosh, it was great fun looking at your photos. And um, I hope that I can find uh, some additional research on some of the soldier that you shared uh, in DC. So, now, going for a trip down the research rabbit hole uh, this evening. And uh, here's the photograph. This also came came to DC photo show, and um, may be hard for you to see. I'm going to put a little closer. This is from the wartime, and um, uh, it's quite interesting. It's a bunch of uh, young women, young girls, who are sitting on a float. And um, over in the right-hand corner, right-hand side of this image, you can just see the man peeking out to the side. He's got a white blouse on. He's got a uh, military cap, and he's holding a flag. It's a 35-star flag. Count them. There's 35 stars. Now, in the center of the photograph stands, of course, the, uh, the ubiquitous Lady Liberty. Uh, you know, some uh, years before the Statue of Liberty, uh, Lady Liberty was uh, quite the popular figure and um, fixture at uh, parades, 
before, during, and after the Civil War. So here we have Lady Liberty. She's wrapped in the stars and stripes. They're literally around her shoulders. She has the crown on top with stars. No question who she is. Now, the girls who surround them, I'm going to start on the, the group to her to our left, the left side of the photo. Um, you can see uh, they're all wearing stars that are interwoven into their Almost, it looks almost like they're they're braided. Um, Liz Topping is watching. She can tell us more about about this technique. You've got stars in their hair. Um, you've got what must be red, white, and blue sashes over their white uh, dresses, and inscribed upon each of these sashes is the name of the state of the union. And guess what? On the other side is another group of girls. Uh, the mirror, all these girls. And if you look closely, you'll see over here, here's the back of the heads of one of the girls. And same thing occurs on the left side. You can see the back of the heads. So what that means to us is that you've got a bunch of girls on one side of the float, the parade float. On the other side are the rest of the girls. There's roughly 17 or 18 girls on the side we can see. So if you figure there's a like number on the other side, Add that number and you get 35, which is the number of stars on the flag that the man was holding. So 35 stars, 35 girls with sashes with the States of the Union. Now, this photograph was taken in Hudson, New York, and 35 stars, 35 states in the 1860s during the war means that these girls are wearing sashes that contain the names of northern and southern states. That's more right here. You can see this young girl in the front. You've got Mississippi right on the front. Uh, and so we've got representing all the states. In terms of, uh, of trying to look for significant clues, as if all of this was not significant enough, the big clue are the flags. Now, turns out there's this flag. All right. Now, take a close look at the star pattern in the canton of this flag, the blue canton. You know what I see? Yeah, it's the word free, F-R-E-E -E in stars. If you add the stars, there's 35 of them. All right, now there's also a stray star at the bottom left of the canton, the 36th star. What's that all about? Here we go again. Here's the cross flags in the center of the float. On one side is that 35 star flag. On the other side is the 36 star free flag. You guys know my background, graphic designer. My first thought was I could draw this thing. So I see it. I can really look at it. So I opened up one of the drawing programs and recreated the flag. And so here's what we see again. Here's the flag, the 35 stars, and the 36 star. My first thought is, okay, this must be one of the flags in a long line of um, flags where you've got letters and numbers on them, right? So uh, who does think of the Bennington flag, right? I believe it's, uh, uh, you know, the spirit of 76, 1777, the Bennington flag with the stars, a semicircular shape, and the big 76. That's where my brain was going. Is it had something to do along those lines. And then I also remembered the centennial. The 1876 centennial has this flag, all the stars spelling out the numbers. And I'm thinking, okay, that makes sense. It's some variation on that. So then I did a little bit of searching around uh, online, did some Google image searches. And lo and behold, boom. I find the free flag. Now, this flag, as it turns out, is, uh, um, is, was used in the 1864 presidential campaign. Uh, these were pro-Republican, pro-Union uh, uh, um, uh, folks who were up for the re-election of Abraham Lincoln as a second term. So uh, they wanted to, uh, obviously, the platform of the Republican Party was to free the and that's exactly 
what this flag is all about. This is freeing the slaves. This flag, this rare flag, I only found a few examples of it online, was used exclusively in the 1864 campaign. Uh, and in fact, I believe that the image of the girls holding the flag, in my experience, it's the only image that uh, I've seen or could find that shows that flag actually being used at the time during Lincoln's re-election campaign. So um, here you have this flag that says free with the 36 stars. Now you may be wondering why, what's up with the 36th star? Why is that all the way out to the side? Well, the answer, if you dig around a little bit, is Nevada. Uh, Nevada became the 36th state. Uh, I see some emojis coming up there. Maybe we have somebody from Nevada, I hope out there tonight watching. Uh, Nevada was the 36th, um, aside from West Virginia. I believe it was the only state to come to the Union uh, during the war. And uh, Nevada was hurried into the Union. Uh, I believe it was something like October 31st of 1864, rushed into the Union so they could vote. Uh, and uh, they voted for Lincoln. 60% voted for Lincoln. 40% voted for the Democrats, uh, which was the party of George B. McClellan. Many of you know as the major general uh, of the Army of the Potomac, who did so much to inspire the men, but was not quite the best general. He was not an aggressive guy, as you know. So uh, this flag, the free flag, is one of many um, flags from that campaign. Uh, Lincoln and his vice president, Andrew Johnson. Um, here's the free stars with Lincoln and Johnson uh, uh, written all over. Here, you're back to the same stars that you saw in the other flag the girls were holding, and you've got the Lincoln and Johnson names on there. Here's another variation on, on that thing. Lincoln and Johnson with the stars. And guess what? Here's another one. Uh, and here's another one. You've got a bunch of these flags that were used in the can of 1864. And so it's clear that my original thinking about numbers and letters being on flags actually was not the right direction. These are campaign flags. The free flag is a campaign flag, just as these flags are campaign flags. So it got me wondering, and this is where I start going further down the rabbit hole, I'm remembering these campaign flags and thinking, I know I've seen them before. So I begin looking into these campaign flags. And uh, of course, you go way back to um, Harry, the 1840 campaign, uh, you've got the log cabin, uh, Harrison and reform. You, you get to see the other uh, Harrison flag, Harrison reform, the ball rolling. That's a literal ball that's being rolled across the countryside. So we're looking around uh, 1840 at this point. Now, the 1844 campaign, you're going to see more of the craziness here. Henry Clay and Freelingheisen, you've got a boat. This her, you know, 1844 is a contentious presidential election. You got a bunch of candidates vying for the opportunity to be president. You got Polk in Dallas, and here's James Knox Polk, Knox Polk in the center of a patriotic wreath surrounded by the stars. You have Millard Fillmore uh, and his party, the Native Americans, beware of foreign influence with a bunch of backward ends and foreign influence on it. You've got uh, in 1856, let's move a little here. Um, you've got the birth of the Republican Party, John C. Fremont for Vice President William Dayton, and you've got uh, Fremont's name, uh, John C. Fremont, the great pathfinder, his wife, Jesse Benton Fremont, the folks who basically made the West what it was. They made California, they popularized California, uh, the first Republican presidential candidate. Uh, many Republicans uh, were proud of Fremont for his role in being the first candidate. They were also very pleased that he did not become president. He did not quite have the permit that they thought a president needed. Anyway, Fremont runs in 56. Uh, of course, one of the other parties, the other side, the Democrats, you've got President James Buchanan, uh, Buchanan, the old uh, uh, statesman um, who winds up presiding over the union of the country. 
of course, in 1860, you've got uh, Lincoln running for his first term. Lincoln Hamlin, there he is in the center of the Blue Canton. You've got him again uh, in the Blue Canton to the side. Uh, you've got him here um, back in uh, with the regular stars in a slightly different pattern. So you've got a wide range. You've got a rich history of uh, campaign flags that are happening during the time. As I mentioned, in the 64 campaign, Lincoln goes up against McClellan, and um, here's McClellan's uh, campaign flag with George H. Pendleton as his vice president. And of course, here's another version. Uh, some real Lincoln haters out there uh, who are saying, Harry McClellan, get in office. Of course, they are disappointed. And uh, at this point, McClellan is uh, without a job. And Lincoln, of course, does not have long to live. However, campaign flags continue to be a big part of our American history. I'll just show you a few of them here. You've got, uh, uh, of course, Ulysses S. Grant. Um, he's wearing his military uniform. He's uh, here with Henry Wilson. It goes on. Another Civil War general, James Garfield and uh, Chester Alon Arthur. We've got another one here. Let's move up to uh, 1884. James G. Blaine and another general, John A. Logan, running for president. Uh, another one in the 1880s, you got Grover Cleveland. He gets the whole centerpiece of Blue Canton. And then uh, the last Civil War soldier to be president, uh, William McKinley of Ohio and for Vice President Garrett A. Bart of New Jersey. Here's their campaign flag with a tastefully arranged star of stars uh, in the center of the canton. One more than 1900 campaign, you've got um, uh, McKinley and um, Theodore Roosevelt running. So it even continues into the 20th century. Got uh, William Howard Taft uh, for president. You've got his big mug shot up there. And then you've also got uh, 1912 Woodrow Wilson. Now, this is the last flag that I was able to find, an actual flag that was changed to campaign flag. And you might be wondering, why, uh, why is that the last one? It seems to have just sort of died off. And here's this rich heritage of flags, probably 80 years, 90 years of the US flag being used, being adapted as a campaign flag. Um, now, I don't have the full answer, but I can tell you one thing that's an interesting coincidence. In 1912, let me go back to Taft. Um, Taft passes an executive order that standardizes the flag, really for the first time in history. And by standardization, I mean he establishes the exact shape of the stars, the exact number of points on the star, the exact placement of the star. He does all of this. He really sort of formalizes the flag, uh, and that's the way it's still today. Of course, as states are added, changes are made to the Blue Canton, um, but it's, it's, it's half. Who, in 1912, with his executive order, he basically sets the guidelines and some pretty harsh rules, some stringent about what the flag should look like. Interesting that at that time, we begin to see the adaptation of the Stars and Stripes for other purposes begin to disappear. So the good things come out of all this is the flag that we know today is very consistent and it is, it's a singular icon. Before that time, as you saw as I was running through, it's a hodgepodge of experimental star patterns all very exciting and all very interesting and all easily adaptable, um, but uh, very different from the flag that we know. Today. So um, I'm going to end here with a simple request. We've got uh, Dave Schaffer, who with Todd Mildfelt is writing a book about um, Colonel James Montgomery, the original Dayhawker from Kansas. Uh, he commanded the 2nd South Carolina Infantry, also known as the 34th U.S. Color Infantry. Uh, Schaefer and Mildfelt are looking for photographs of uh, men in the ranks, um, private sergeants from the 34th USCT. I have not found any. If you got one, 
you guys want to know about it. And so let me know if you have such an image. And by the way, just to help you refresh your memory, um, the 34th U.S. Uh, color entry was commanded, as these guys mentioned in their book, um, by a fellow named Montgomery. Now, that, uh, this photograph of him may not immediately catch your memory, and you may not recall his face, but if you know the movie Glory, uh, you will remember that face. And so, on that note, I'm going to leave you for the evening. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, stay safe, be well, happy hunting, happy research, and also don't forget, on Saturday, we are having, uh, in conjunction with Civil War Faces, we're going to be offering dealers the opportunity to sell their images uh, live on Facebook uh, on Civil War Faces Marketplace. So stay tuned for more information, and, and um, we'll see you next time on Military Images Live. Have a great night, and thank you for watching.